Hi, Bill. How are you doing today? Robin, I'm doing fantastic, man. Good to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Most of Europe is currently baking around 45 Celsius, which I think oh. is 90 plus Fahrenheit for you. But luckily, the UK is in a drizzling downpour. How's uh, life over in the States? Well done. It's, uh, you know, we're a little hazy over here, certainly where I'm located, where those wildfires up in Canada are making sure that we have a nice shield over our heads. So not too warm, but a little tough to breathe sometimes. So a good shield, like a sassy provider, sat in the middle mile, protecting you from attacks and threats. And so I'm, I'm not selling. I'm not selling. <laughs> not at all. Not <laughs> at all. <laughs> so, Bill, what, what do you have for us today? Robin, I want to talk to you about something that's all over the news right now. And this falls under the category of Doug Adams saying, don't panic. And that is Worm GPT. You heard of Worm GPT? Oh, I have. I have. It's pretty scary. But for the listeners out there that might not be following along, what is Worm GPT? Well, Worm GPT, as you might guess, is a generative AI platform. But what's different about this from the one that you might know as Chat GPT is that this one does not have the guardrails. So Ooh. you, yeah, right. A little, uh, little spooky there. But what it gives users the ability to do is to essentially get in and do all the things that they're not allowed to do in chat GPT. So mm -hmm. why is it in the news? Well, the reason it's in the news is because we're seeing lots of examples of folks writing malware code or, or pseudo code, or even using it for, uh, you know, compromising businesses, uh, enterprises, their emails by writing very convincing phishing attempts. Because again, mm -hmm. large language model, it, it speaks well. So some of the old school ways of trying to be safe by reading the email closely and seeing if it sounds like a native speaker, that's what they're trying to overcome. And, oh. you know, it's, it's also fun because I, I guess some threat actors are using Worm GPT to also do what's being referred to as LLM supply chain poisoning. So large language model <laughs> supply chain poisoning by basically pushing out a bunch of garbage data to the large language models and, uh, and basically corrupting them. Mm, so we've seen that in the past where people are effectively running denial of service attacks against these large language models. Because right. At the end of the day, if garbage goes in, garbage will come out. And that's, that's right. You know, people complained that in the original beta of GPT-3 that the the information was good, but it was okay. And then when GPT-4 launched, people were astounded with what it could output and think, this is fantastic. But now a lot of people are saying the quality of GPT-4 is going downhill. And the reason it's going downhill is because of humans. That's we're right. getting lazy. We're not reinforcing positive behavior. We're just entering data and watching things get spat back out. So That's the right. overall quality is degrading alongside humanity's output. But you, you say Worm GPT doesn't have the guardrails. Now, tools like ChatGPT, people have been trying to jailbreak it effectively sure. for quite a while, trying to remove those safety barriers, trying to get it to it to curse words or write diss tracks from rap lyrics. I've seen quite a few of that popping up. So right. how is Worm GPT really any different to ChatGPT? Well, again, it's just those guardrails that are deliberately removed. And, and you're certainly right. If you go into ChatGPT through the normal web interface, there are some guardrails. Uh, the way that a lot of folks are getting around that is with APIs, utilizing the API to, to circumvent that. And we've talked a lot about how, for example, ChatGPT, if you spend long enough with it, you can, in effect, make it begin to hallucinate and, and lose <laughs> touch with reality. And, and listen, maybe I'm being a little bit too Pollyanna about this, but this is why when, when people approach and they're very panicked about this technology, you know, saying the birth of AI and everybody likes to make Skynet references and so forth. I, I, I really tend to fall in that camp of, you know, let's relax, folks. Uh, artificial intelligence, we've been utilizing it for quite some time, certainly on the defender side. We've uh, we've been utilizing it. We, we're, we're very good at it. The heuristics that we've developed in machine learning, very, very effective. So yeah, you're necessarily going to see this, Robin, garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. In the case of Worm GPT, in order to utilize this, and, and by the way, you can download Worm GPT if you choose, of course, some assembly required, as they say. And, uh, and I would also advise be very careful of the integrity <laughs> of the files that you download for Worm GPT. 
But if you do utilize the web interface, similar to what you would do with chat GPT, that's going to cost you about 900 US dollars per year, Robin. And mm -hmm. you're going to have to provide some personally identifiable information. So you know, caveat emptor, buyer beware on something like that. But mm -hmm. what, what I think was most interesting as these news articles began to come out with almost a sense of panic is that really a survey was done of, of folks that we might call traditional black hat hackers, right? These are the hackers that are hacking for profit or for social purposes or whatnot. And almost 70% of them came back and said that they felt that Worm GPT or, or this new, you know, AI push that suddenly the public is very aware of really isn't going to change anything. You know, they, they make the point that it, it, this has really already been in use from a defender's perspective. So really, this is just an increase in uh, availability, accessibility. Now, you and I, Robin, a, a, as we talk about this a little bit, my personal belief, and again, th th this is just my belief, is that all this essentially does is expands the pool of script kitties, mm -hmm. really, where you now have the ability for amateurs who want to want to get into this to go out and very easily create things that they may not even know effectively works. Worm GPT, for example, does uh, Python coding as well as pseudocode. And I tell you, if, if it creates something that doesn't work, good luck with the debug process, right? <laughs> if, if you're one of those newer <laughs> script kiddies. But, but I will tell you that some of the dark web forums that we're monitoring right now, we're seeing Boy, I know in one particular set that that uh, I'm aware of, there's around 30 posts a day uh, around Worm GPT. So it it certainly is visible, but I think the folks who who are the real deep threats, they kind of know that Worm GPT has a certain place, and it's going to tend toward those who uh, are a little bit less informed and are simply looking for an easy button to begin to execute on some of their attacks. So the good news is. If we have an effective education program for end users, because again, these are getting a little bit more convincing, these phishing emails in terms of their grammar and so forth, it, it, they, they tend to be looking a lot more legitimate. So I'm talking about education around context. Are you mm -hmm. expecting such an email? Do you know how to check and, and verify that it's coming from a trusted place or that the the it, it's being spoofed and and where does it actually reply and where do the links go? All right. All of those things. The other aspect is, and, and you and I are intimately familiar with this, Robin, for the, the solution that we represent, having intelligent blocking for generative AI categories. Yeah. Why don't we just stop the access, right? Uh, we, we do have the capability of doing that. And then I guess the last thing that I think about is uh, I know in, in some of the dark web forums that I've been watching, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion around some of the encryption techniques that Worm GPT can use to encrypt the malware. And that may sound a little bit alarming as well, because now you've got individuals who are not incredibly experienced suddenly able to do that encryption and, and mm -hmm. quote unquote bypass uh, anti malware engines. But uh, again, good powerful next generation anti-malware and the ability to set policy that says, look, if I see something that looks like it's encrypted with the AES encryption standard with a symmetric key that I can't possibly decrypt, uh, certainly in the next 40,000 years, <laughs> block that payload as well. So um, I guess in some, the point is don't panic. Uh, this does exist. You're going to see a lot of articles around this. It gets great press and generates a lot of clickbait uh, to, to, you know, to commercialize and to monetize, but uh, it's okay. Everything's going to be okay. There are solutions that uh, you're able to implement. And, and certainly we're familiar with one that uh, I think is very powerful, single vendor SASE solution with shared context. It's going to be okay, Robin. It's going to be okay. It's okay. You know, I've been looking at similar posts around the, the internet and to follow the hitchhiker's analogy, I'm seeing half the population act like Marvin, the downtrodden, depressed robot going, Right. There's all new kids coming to actually destroy things. They are, they're running basic strips again. That's but then right. you have the people who are more 
well, the people who are seeing this as a reduced barrier to entry, they're more like the Zaphod Beeblebrox, the two-headed, bombastic, right. excited guy, be like, yeah, I can do everything, I can Absolutely. create ransomware. And I've seen that explosion happen, not just on the forums, but it's now spilling out into TikTok, it's spilling out into sure threads. And people are seeing hacking, and I say I use this term hacking so loosely, they're mm. using adversarial tools, they're using security tools, and they're thinking this is simple. A heck, That's right. look at Flipper Zero. Have you heard of Flipper Zero? I own one, in fact, Robin. Absolutely. Okie dokie. Hopefully it's legal in the US. But <laughs> uh, the, the Flipper Zero, for those who aren't aware, it's a simple NFC RFID repeater. So you can read NFC tags, it can store data in the, the board, and you can replay that. Now, there's a ton of other stuff you can do. It has nice uh, IO pins. You can solder a whole bunch of other stuff to it. However, it's being used quite frequently to do harmless pranks, like opening Tesla charging ports, or right. unlocking people's hotel rooms, or replicating access entry cards in and out of buildings. So at the very curious level, that's fine. However, I'm seeing a lot of these kiddies, like script kiddies, using this for more nefarious needs, and they are passing it around very, very quickly. I'm also seeing a large rise in skimmers, Credit card skimmers. A mm. uh, close friend, uh, he purchased one for $26. Simple $26 as a card skimmer reader. Wow. And as a security test, no, not in public, uh, he walked around a room and it was all students just holding the skimmer at waist height and just walking past. And on that one walk around, he managed to get $380 just by it sat in his pocket. Now, if you are on a subway, if you're on a bus, if you're in a crowded place, all it takes is one person walking through that crowded bodega and they have thousands of dollars all authorized. Which, That's right. you know, by the way, folks, don't forget physical security. Store all of your cards in Faraday Shields, RFID. RFID, baby. That's right. RFID secured stuff. If it's wireless, it's unsecure. Please lock it down. But tools like Worm GPT plus tools like Flipper Zero or the, the rubber duckies or Wi Fi pineapples or any of the easy de auth watches you can get to just de auth people's. Wi Fi's, these have really lowered the barrier to entry because the technology that we are relying on to be secure and connected has kind of stayed the same. AES, DES, that's not new. That's been here for a while. WPA2 for Wi Fi encryption, that's been here a while. But whilst that standard stays, technology around it is becoming more accessible. And there's a greater divide now between those who understand the technology and those who can use the technology. Bill, when was the last time you looked at a manual for an iPhone? I think never, approximately. Never. Yeah, thank you. You picked up the device. It was user intuitive. Of you course. got your solution. You got your output. And that's the same with lots of these tools. So Worm GPT, Chat GPT, Flipper Zero, and all of the other things out there just make it a lot easier for people to achieve a goal. And even outside of the world of security, outside of the security theater, we're seeing a huge explosion in no code tools. Look at Zapier. Zapier, you can just say, oh, I'll drag and drop this. I want one device to talk to another device. This is the flow I want. And it works. Or Power Automate or any of the tools out there. Now, this used to be a coding nightmare with high skill sets, high barrier to entry. But mm. now that barrier to entry has dropped, there's more widespread attacks. And the more widespread a technology is, the greater protection and prevention you need against it. So whilst a vendor like Cato can't protect against a physical access with somebody cloning your card. You can educate a user on how to behave. You can put the right security policies and procedures in place to mitigate the potential impact. Because as more and more people are exposed to this technology, it's going to be normalized. That's very, right. very normalized. Heck, very my six-year-old often says, Dad, I'm going to hack you. That's in his vocabulary. That's in his vernacular. He knows what that means. He knows it's sure. about extorting. It's no, it's about stealing information. He says, I'm going to hack your Roblox account and take all your Robux. That's a, the equivalent <laughs> of an adult saying, I'm going to break into your bank account and steal all of your dollars, shekels, right. pounds, lira, euros, whatever it might be. Just it's a ma micro scale. So when this six-year-old becomes 18, the world's going to be a very different place and we need to scale and move along with it. Mm. Sorry, I went into... Uh, lecture mode there. Sorry, Bill. No, I love that. You know, it, it, and yeah. it's easy to go into lecture mode on that because this is a natural evolution. We see this happening even at the deeper levels of advanced persistent mm -hmm. threat actors where mm -hmm. the commoditization of expertise 
that's really what we're talking about, Robin, is, mm -hmm. is turning that into a commodity in order to monetize. The struggle will always be, how do you keep the uninformed or the unaware aware mm -hmm. of the fact that it's becoming easier? The, the point of entry is much lower, the old 80-20 rule, so to speak. Uh, it, it's, it's something to talk about. Certainly not something we're going to solve on, on this episode at all, but I, I love beginning to think about that because we're going to continue to see that over time. Uh, you know, suddenly mm -hmm. AI is available. Now everybody has a hold of it and everybody panics. Uh, you talked yeah. about the flipper. You talk about any of these uh, these skimming devices, which I, you know, good fun to to, to talk about that. <laughs> Very inexpensive to buy an RFID yep. shield for those things. We we mm -hmm. need to start thinking in those ways. How do we close the eighty? on that 80, 20 rule. I think that's very important to educate from that perspective because so, so long as you can narrow that gap and that's, what's very interesting. It's inexpensive to narrow the gap on that 80%. It's that last 20% where there's a significant investment, whether it's time, talent, or treasure. And uh, I think that's why you, when you take a look at security as a service, it makes a lot of sense because you have the experts there. They're able to do that for you, certainly from an organizational perspective. Uh, and then maybe we, we think philosophically about how the end user can take advantage as well. <laughs> Close friend recently lost his job as an illustrator. As people said that mid-journey and stable diffusion could replace everything he's doing. Oh maybe my. Worm GPT will replace quite a few threat actors out there. After all, we don't need to hire Lockbit anymore. We can just, we can code our malware ourselves. Oh, sure. Right? <laughs> For red team, blue team, purple teaming, of course. Legitimate purposes, not illegitimate. Naturally, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your time today, Bill. Until next time, you stay safe out there. Been a pleasure as always, Robin. Thanks.